Good afternoon from Papist Persuasion, folks. We have uh, something different for you. We're always different, but uh, something different uh, today. Uh, we have from uh, La Belle France, uh, well, La Bretagne, uh, Brittany, we have Patrick Mollard. I've been chasing Patrick for about the last 10 years, uh, <laughs> trying to get him on Papist Persuasion. And uh, I think we've almost managed it. We'll know by the end of this program whether it's a success, but I'm quite sure it will be. Uh, Patrick's a very interesting chap. Uh, beside his piping in Brittany, uh, his interest in the peer uh, and has taken him across to Scotland uh, and uh, Bill Morrill, uh, Bob Brown, uh, Nicol, and very, very important people in the, the world of uh, Peabrook, as uh, those amongst you who are aware of Peabrook will uh, recognise that fact. But uh, I like to that uh, Patrick went across to Ireland to study the Irish music. Now, that uh, greatly assisted in the, uh, a trophy across in Lorient, uh, originally known as the Macallan Trophy, and we'll hear when that was set up and when, uh, because of French government advertising restrictions, we to change the name from Macallan to McCrimmon. And uh, Patrick will tell you about that. So, go round the wee circle and then uh, we'll branch off or we'll maybe even mention a pipe band that uh, Patrick was involved with, Jackie Parsi. I think it's a uh, That's great. Uh, right. So, uh, and they uh, will go on from there. So I'm talking too much as usual, as you're all very uh, much aware. So I just want you to sit back and enjoy, because uh, the first question to Patrick is, Patrick, uh, welcome, uh, bienvenue, uh, Papers Persuasion, and... Um, I want you to tell the audience, uh, those of those uh, us that are in uh, Hawaii and uh, South America, Argentina, and all these places that they uh, watch Piper's persuasion and they don't know very much about piping. So we've got to appeal to the broader audience here and maybe explain things more than uh, just the experts. So could you tell us, Patrick, where you come from originally, where you're staying now, what you, you did for a living, if anything, other than piping, and uh, where you picked up your piping interest and how it developed. So we'll start from there. How's that go? Okay, Alan. Well, thanks very much for your invitation, anyway. And as you say, you've been chasing me for years, and I don't know why we, we never managed to, to get a round of <laughs> C'est la vie. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was uh, I was born in Brittany, which is the, the west part of France. Uh, more exactly, I was born in a town called Saint-Malo on the coast, on the north coast, just opposite uh, Jersey and Guernsey. And uh, I started piping at the age of 14 in my local bagad. As you know, a bagad is a pipe band with the pipes and drums and bombards. And my brother and I, my brother Dominic and I, I think we must have been impressed by uh, a pipe band. I'm not sure whether it was the Edinburgh Police pipe band. Uh, they apparently they did a tour in Brittany in the 60s, and they must have played in. But well, I know they played in Brest, but probably they played in Saint Malo because I have that picture in my mind of these giants with feather bonnets and pipes and. My brother and I, we said, we want to do this. And my brother wanted to play the drums, and I wanted to play the pipes. So we joined the Vagad of Saint Malo, but uh, in, uh, unfortunately, they, they were short of bombard players at the time. So they said, no, you're going to play the bombard first, and we will see later on. So I, I played the bombard for a year and a half. So did my brother. And, uh, but I, I was really determined to play the pipe shot. So I managed to borrow a set of pipes from a friend of mine and a, a practice chanter. And I had a book and I sort of 
taught myself you know, the fingering and uh, the grace notes secretly because I was not supposed to play the text. And so when I really had my first lesson, I had good basis on piping. And um, I remember that the, the Bagar organized a, a wee competition within the, the, the band that was in 1966. And I, I got second prize playing the, the Highland Pipes. And among the judges, there was Jean-Pierre Pichard, who was to be the director of the uh, Inter-Celtic Festival in Lorient. I think you know that he, he, yes. he, he died last uh, August. Yes, I heard that. So he, he, he was, and actually he was my first teacher who taught me my first 6 eight march. I remember he, he taught me uh, uh, Angus McKinnon. Uh -huh. And uh, because he, he was w uh, working as a teacher in the uh, Samaro Grammar School, and I was in the same grammar school, so I used to go to him for some tuition, you know. So I got the prize, and the first prize was uh, I was sent to a piping course which was held in Douarnenez in the west of Brittany. That was in 1967. And there I met my first teacher, who was Jackie Pinsett, Jacques Pinsett, who, who gave, gave me all the technique that I now have. You know? And uh, he, he was just back from a year in Scotland. He had uh, worked in Porthor, and he, he had played in a pipe band over there. And he, 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 was, he wanted to make a pipe band. And so he started the first pipe band in Brittany, the pipe band Arnere, which you mentioned. That was in 1967. And meanwhile, my brother, who had learned, uh, started to, to play the drums, joined the band as well. So we left the Samalo Bagad and we joined a new band, which was based in Rennes. Rennes is not very far from Samalo, it's only one hour driving. And as I was a student at the university learning English, so I, I moved to Rennes and I joined the honorary band. And gradually we started playing and competing in Scotland. We competed in 1970. I remember we competed at the Rothsay Games. Yes. The Coal Games. And we were graded in, if I remember, we were in third grade. And we were upgraded in 1971 to second grade. So that was not bad for, for the time, you know? Very good. Um, so there was, it, it was a pipe band. There was no bomb band at all. And we even wore the kilt. We, we had a kilt. It was, a, I can't remember the tartan, Ancient Hunter. Uh, I have pictures that I can send you of uh, this. Good. These days, we, we can see the whole band. Uh, playing at the Coral Games, nice pictures. In 1973, we competed at the Toronto Games in Canada. Mm -hmm. And we were very successful. We were in second grade there. And I remember that we left Toronto directly to Scotland and we competed at, at Coral again, Coral and uh, some other games. And we, we were quite uh, successful again. And that was a very, very good start for me because at the time, actually, I knew more Scottish music than I knew Breton music. I was an MSR player, Fibrach, because Jacques, meanwhile, Jacques had followed uh, uh, the teaching of Bob Brown in 1968. He stayed with Bob Brown for two weeks uh, at Balmoral. And when he came back, he had all these big tapes with the playing of Bob Brown, you know. And when I heard these tapes, I said, I want to do that. I want to learn Pibroch. And I want to learn from Bob Brown. I was really de determined, you know. And since I was to be a, a, an English teacher, and uh, I was supposed to spend a year in uh, the United Kingdom, uh, the majority of the students asked for, for England, but I asked for Scotland. And I asked for Aberdeen, because I, I looked on the map that Aberdeen was not too far from Balmoral. 
And I was sent right to Aberdeen, and I spent a year in Aberdeen teaching at the Royal Rubislow Academy, uh, which was uh, now I think it's it has changed the name to Aberdeen Grammar School or something like that. Uh, Rubislow Academy was the, the school where Lord Byron did his studies. There is a, a big statue of Lord Byron in front of. That's Aberdeen. amazing, yeah. Huh? And there. So uh, that was in 1971. And during the summer of 71, I did some competing, solo com competing in Scotland. And I met Bob Brown. And I think he gave me a prize in one of the, the games. I don't remember if it was Balata, Balata or Bremar. And so I went to see him and I said, would you accept to give me some tuition in Pibroch? And he said, well, we, we will see. Just pay me a visit, I'll see what I can do for you. And that was the beginning of a long story. And I, I used to go there almost, not every weekend, but I, I tried to go there as often as, as possible. I would take the bus from Aberdeen. So, to now, what uh, tune did you get? What was the first tune you recall uh, from Bob Brown? Uh, I think the first one, I think it must have been the Lament for Mary McLeod. That's a difficult tune, you know. Yes. Yeah. I, it, no, it's, it's easy to finger, but it's a difficult one to actually bring the music out. It, it is, and I don't know why I asked for that tune, but anyway, it, uh, uh -huh. actually, he taught me, well, unfortunately, as you know, he died when I was yeah. there. He died in May uh, 1972, and I was still in Scotland. And um, by the way, I still have a letter from Bob Brown. The last letter he sent to me and said, Dear Patrick, uh, he finished his letter saying, Still no news when I must go down below. And of course, uh -huh. he meant New Zealand. But when you know what happened, you know, I, I was really yeah. impressed by the letter. And when he died, I went to see Bob Nickel for more tuition. So, so from them, I got. What tunes did he cover uh, after that, then? Well, uh, we did all the big tunes. I remember that Bob Brown would say, well, if, if you want to learn the big three, go and see Nickel. This is Nick, one of Nickel's tunes. And okay. you know that they, they managed with John McDonald of Inverness, they, they managed to learn different tunes. And it's true that Nickel was a, a, absolutely... A, a, Magnificent on, on the big three. And yeah. uh, Bob Brown is tuned with the Man for the Children or Donald Dougal Mackay. You know. Yeah. Uh, I, got, I got all these big tunes from them uh, Patrick Hawk, uh, uh, My King has London in My Dart, The Angels in Cassaration. Um, and I remember that the last time I was with him, uh, I went with Donald Morrison who was living in Aberdeen, and Donald right. went to Bob for the, the medal. And I, so I, I listened, I was there, I listened to his lesson with Bob, and he did tunes like My Dearest on Earth, Give Me Your Kiss, um, McLeod of Talisker Salute, all the tunes which were on the set tunes that year. You know? mm -hmm. so, uh, I kind of got some benefits from the lessons because I got the tunes as as well, you know. <laughs> and um, I remember on the way back to Aberdeen with Donald, we both spoke of how great was Bob as a player. And of course, we we couldn't guess that it was the last time we were seeing him, you see. Yeah, but, uh, more than, I, I got plenty of tunes, but what I got from them, from them is uh, a method, a method of of phrasing the tunes. Uh, Bob Brown used to call this the scansion of the tune. You know, the things like strong, medium, medium, strong, or medium, strong, medium, stronger. He would yeah. explain why you would cut a note or stay on a note. And it, it was very precise in his teaching, you know. And what I did later, I just applied this method not only to Pibroch, but also to Breton music and to any kind of music for phrasing 
the quality of rain and singing. He taught me to, uh, to sing all my tunes. And, and I really, I... Now, we understand that uh, Brown and Nico uh, sang rather than played practice chanters uh, right. when yes. teaching. Yeah. They, they, they sang uh, the various phrases and uh, through that they would teach you about the flow and bringing the music out and uh, all, all these subtle things and just holding on to a note for micro settings and uh, just yeah. that makes all the difference. And uh, some people are frightened to hold on to a note, they come off it too uh, quickly. And yes. They, they cannot just let the note breathe out. And yes, they... that's right. And, and I remember that Bob Brown used to say, the problem with young players, they don't cut their short notes enough. Yeah. They, they were afraid of cutting a note. And they, would, you know, they, they wouldn't take a risk. And it, very often he said, don't be afraid to cut. Don't be afraid to cut. Don't play this tune too slow. Uh, people think that Pibro is slow, but it, it's not always slow. It depends on the character of the tune. And so mm -hmm. he, would, he would teach me the story behind the tune and the feeling. He, he would say, you must uh, portray a feeling. Uh, Pibro is not only music, it's the portrait of, of a feeling. And if you, uh, if you don't play a lament as a lament or a gathering tune as a gathering tune, it can be musical, but uh, it, it is not uh, uh, according to tradition. You, th there are a number of tricks that you must know, for instance, to play a gathering. There's a call at the beginning of the tune. And if there's no call... I, I, I was in Vareri on Tuesday, uh, in Vareri Games on Tuesday, and I heard somebody playing McDougall's Gathering. Ah, that's a good example, yes. Right, and they... Uh, for me, it was too slow, pedantic. It needed to be driven a, a bit more, especially the first two bars with all the ease and the strikes. Yeah, uh, well, just mm -hmm. just to play through. And Ronnie Laurie, I don't know if you ever heard Ronnie Laurie playing that tune. No, I don't think so. I I, I have I remember but Ronnie he, Laurie. He was absolutely magnificent at playing that tune. I can still remember way back in the 60s, oh, when he yeah. played that, the US and Barrett competition. Bob, Bob and, uh, Brown used to say, wonderful. I remember he said, it's a call to the four cardinal points. And it, as you say, he was uh, insisting on the very first bar of this tune. I can still hear his voice, Dribi, Yawin, Dribi, Yawin, Dribi, Yawin. And his singing was so beautiful yes. that immediately it went into your body, you know, and, yes. you, and you really knew what you were doing afterwards. You know. And yeah. sometimes he would show me the music and, uh, in the book and he said, well, you see, Patrick, the music is in front of your eyes, but you don't see it because it's just crutches, quavers, things like this. But you need someone who has been taught properly with the song. If you don't get the song, it's just meaningless. Yes, yes. And Bob, Bob Nichol insisted as well that uh, Bob Brown was very lyrical you know, when he spoke about this. And uh, uh, Bob, Brown, Bob Nichol was more straightforward. This is the way I got it from old John. <laughs> uh, sometimes I would say to Bob Nickel, but it's not exactly how I got it from Bob Brown. Is that so? Ah. And he would say, well, same stable but different horses. I, I, I. <laughs> well, that, but the people besides bringing out the music and the, the flow that, that you've been speaking about, are frightened to put their own stamp onto a tune, really, aren't they? Yes, uh, that's the thing. For years and years, I was very faithful to, my, to the teaching of my teacher. But now uh, I'm older, of course, and sometimes I, I do some little things that Bob Brown or Bob Nichol didn't really 
I don't know if, if they would accept this, but I remember Barbara said, I cannot judge the music, Patrick, but I can judge the luck of it. Uh, so he, he always said that. <laughs> and he said, listen to what I say, but take your own decisions and stick to it. And uh, so that's what I did. I, I have the teaching in my head and I have my own personality of of course, I, I don't try to be a pale copy of Bob Brown. It's, it's, it's not really... I try to uh, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned all the big tunes about not. You mentioned a lot of the big tunes there. Uh, and, but it was also excellent at uh, uh, smaller tunes, uh, uh, you know, Too Long in This Condition, Tall Hard. Of uh, course, to mention yes. too. And even smaller tunes like the Pretty Duck. I got mm -hmm. the Pretty Duck from that tunes which only one oiler and one variation. Uh, uh, Red Hector of the Battles. Um, anyway, we tunes that are scarcely heard because they are not complete. So they are not played in big competitions uh, because there's no tall one, no Kranua. And uh, Bob Brown loved these Wii tunes, and um, I, I got a few of them with, with them. And uh, yeah, you, you, men you mentioned Red H Hector of the Battles. I heard uh, Alan McDonald playing that once uh, many years ago on the uh, Radio Scotland the Pipeline program. Uh, he gave a different slant uh, from any of the books, and they played it very lively and all the rest of it. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Alan's McDonald's uh, uh, take on Bieber is uh, totally different again, you know, uh, from the lights of uh, the more traditional uh, aspects uh, as produced by Brown and Nickel. Yeah. But I've been interested to know how Brown and Nickel would have played Red Hector the Battles. Well, uh, Bob Brown had a longer version of I read Hector the Battle. He played a tune called Hector Roy McLean, which was a tune with uh, Tarwa Ankrun. And the, the aura is almost similar that the Hector of the Battles with, with a few differences. And there is, it's a complete tune with Tarwa Ankrun. And you can uh -huh. find it in, you, you will find it in William Ross's book, William Ross, Queen Victoria's Piper. Yes, yes. And uh, it's a very interesting piece, beautiful. It's funny that you mentioned this tune because uh, I want to play it uh, next um, September in Concal. We have the Fibra by the Sea. Yes, and, and, uh, and I'm going to play there. And my choice, I wanted to play uh, Red Hector of the Battle, the, the long tune, and Donald de Mackay. <laughs> Very, very good. Aye. And then, by the hey, way, see while well you're on, see while well you're on about Kankal. Hey, just tell the viewers about Kankal briefly. What the the, the setup is there? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, Kankal is a, an idea of Jacques Pincé, who he lives in Kankal, and he thought that it would be a nice idea to uh, to make people discover that beautiful music, Pibra, to associate this music with lovely landscapes. And Concal is a beautiful place of Brittany uh, facing the Mont Saint-Michel in the background. And so every year we have that meeting of pipers. It's not a competition. It's free, open to anyone, only people, of course. And it's on, on a Sunday morning. Then we, we all go down to the beach and we play by the seaside in the afternoon. Where we have a, a nice... Uh, uh, meal together with uh, seafood and oysters. <laughs> yes. And, and there's no judges. It's just a concert of young and old players. Because uh, until two or three, four years ago, we had Jimmy McIntosh himself. Yes. Came all the way from America and he was 92 at the time, I think. And he played there a couple of pibrochs. And there was an old man also from, from Holland, the 75, came all the way from Holland with, with friends, and they had the kilt on, and all the gear, you know. Aye. And we have 
players from all over Brittany and from different parts of France, from Paris, from, and we have more and more success. We've had a few uh, Scotsmen, like uh, we had Dr. Landis McDonald, we had Jack Taylor. Uh, by the way, this year, Jack is coming back and we will be running together, myself and Jack, the, the um, workshop, the people of workshop on the Good. Saturday afternoon. So Saturday afternoon, people workshop, and on Sunday, the meeting by the seaside. So, so how, many people, uh, how many people typically in the past uh, turned up to play a Peabrook at Kunkal? Uh, 20 or 15, or what was the sort oh, of number? I think last year we had about almost uh, 45 Peabrooks. My goodness. Left. 20, <laughs> 20 in the morning and uh, 25 in the afternoon. Uh, and, and compositions, not only the classical uh, stuff, but some people play their own compositions. Uh -huh. uh, Jacques, in particular, Jacques Pincé, he composes a lot. And so he composes uh, his own pibrachs, which, which are influenced by Breton music. And you have uh, compositions from America and uh, but mostly it's the traditional stuff with all the big tunes, you know. And Good. it attracts a big crowd, well, not thousands, but hundreds, I would say, of people who have absolutely no idea of what a pibrach is and even what a set of pipes is. But they find it so magical that they just stay and listen, mouth open, like this. Uh, Oh, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. And uh, the, the audiences uh, in France are a uh, tremendous thing. I, I, I played Peabrook across there and uh, they give you a very good listen and uh, they're very quiet and attentive and uh, they applaud very politely once you're finished, which is nice <laughs> also. Uh, but you don't get anybody getting up and walking out. Uh, mm. I once watched uh, Alan McDonald doing a lunchtime recital piping live many years ago. Mm -hmm. That's the week before the Worlds at the National Piping Centre. And he was playing Flame of Wrath for a uh, squinting Pasek. Yeah. And, and playing at 100 miles an hour as uh, Alan always does, you know. Mm -hmm. And there was two women sitting in the back row with their knitting. And they folded up their knitting after the first uh, line of the Peabrook and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so that's uh, good, uh, Carl. Tell me, uh, out of the sea, going back to Balmoral again, just ever so briefly, uh, what is, do you feel is possibly your favourite Peabrook? That you took from there. Oh, there are many. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I mentioned the lament of the children, which is uh, so beautiful. But one tune I got from Bob Brown, I remember well. It was the Earl of Seaforth salute, oh, yeah. and I, and I couldn't get the beginning of the tune oh, yeah. properly. Uh, hum, bum, be, el, that was his yeah. counteract, El Louis. And since I had difficult, difficulties to find the right rhythm, he took my hand and he put his own hand on my hand and fingered the note, El Louis, so that I could feel yes. his hand. And I got it. I said, I think I, I got the rhythm, you know, because I was playing dun, that is, thing like this, you know. And he would say, you must roll the notes. Uh -huh. Wow, and I said, that's a beautiful tune. tune. Beautiful. That's Fred, Fred Morrison's favorite tune in the Brittany at Lorient, isn't it? The, ah, he, he, he a couple of years ago, he, he won the people at Lorient playing that very tune. Yeah, remember that. The LFC 4 and uh, and I got some 
uh, heavy tunes that uh, few people play. It's like the vaunting. I got the vaunting yeah. from Bob Brown, which, which is a, like the, the Flame of Wrath. It's a very uh, dull tune. The bottom hand notes only, you know, and you yes. really have to put a lot of expression to, to make the tune live. Uh, right. If you don't know that the, the, the recipes, it can be very boring. Or tune yeah. like the Red Speckled Bull, which I got from Bob Nicol, and the Red Speckled Bull, the same is there's only three or four notes in the tune. And if you don't um, uh, make variations in your tempo of the different variations, it can become very, very boring too. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, all the, the big tunes like Angels and Castration, uh, and uh, what else did we uh, play? The Lament for Alistair Jarek McDonald of Glengarry. Uh -huh. uh, I got from, from Brown. Uh, uh, Colin Roy McKenzie. Uh, well, we, we did, at the time, I had the 12 books of the Hero Society, and we would go through the books, especially with Bob Nickel. We, we could do three, four tunes sometimes within an hour. Uh -huh. uh, he was very quick. You know, Have you got the tune, Patrick? So, well, I think so. Well, what is your, what is your next tune? <laughs> <laughs> that, um, no, you, 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 I take it that you never recorded your lessons. Uh, not at the beginning, but because I was a bit shy to take my my tape yeah. recorder, and in those days we didn't have all these smartphones. I know, and, I, I, big, I, big machines. But uh, at the end, I managed to get a um, stock of tapes, which I got from uh, my friend Ian Duncan, because yeah. I, I, we were the, the three, uh, uh, we were together at the same time, Ian, Jack, Bill Wotherspoon, and myself, we were studying with the two Bobs, you know, and uh, I managed to get some tapes from Ian Duncan, a lot right. of tapes of Bob Brown, and I recorded Bob Nickel myself, in yeah. Kantarach. So I have plenty of big, big tapes here of Bob Nichol singing in Kantarach, but very few recordings of Bob Nichol playing the pipes. Okay. Bob, Brown, Bob Brown had a tape recorder and he would tape himself. And he would send the tapes to Dr. Kenneth McKay uh, from, uh, was he from a boy or Bremer? Can't remember. And uh, Doc, Dr. Kenneth Mackay had um, students in Pima. So most of the tapes I have, you can hear Bob Brown's voice saying, well, doctor, this is a recording of color hard or uh, too long in this condition for your pupils. And I managed to have copies of all these tapes. So I have all yeah. these tapes here. And you, you will find them in, in most of these recordings you will find in the series the CDs, Masters of Pibroch, uh, edited by um, uh, Robert Wallace and Norman Matheson. I, Robert Matheson, I spoke to about that when I was uh, speaking to him and Jack Taylor and the other chap, uh, the, the ex-policeman again, what's his name? Uh, at, at a boy, I went up to a boy and interviewed oh, him. Uh, Duncan Watson? Aye. Aye, he was a... I, I, it was quite funny because uh, I was pressing this question about modern Pibroch on them, and uh, uh, Watson and uh, Matheson said, don't listen to it, you know. <laughs> 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 they were quite adamant. <laughs> so, uh, it was a traditional old uh, Pibrochs are nothing, you know. And uh, Jack was a bit more relenting. He was okay, you know. I remember I was friendly with uh, Norman Matheson, because he was a, a surgeon in Aberdeen. Yeah. Yeah. And at the time when I was in Aberdeen, he started the Aberdeen Piping Society. And I was a member of the Aberdeen Piping Society. And I used to go there and have a tune every time. And I remember we had Bob Nickel, or was it Bob Nickel or Bob Brown one day, who came personally and gave, gave us a recital. And then I left Aberdeen. I had to go back to Brittany to, uh, from uh, had finished my year in Aberdeen. So I never went back to that Aberdeen Piping Society. I don't know if it's still going on, but uh, I must say that I'm very proud to know that I was one of the members 
uh, of uh, founders of the Aberdeen Python Society. Excellent. Uh, uh, Patrick, uh, just to change the subject, um, why did you go to Ireland? Oh, that's because uh, so I went back. But the thing is, when Bob Brown died, I was so affected by the death of Bob Brown. You know, it's like, uh, I went back to Brittany, and at that time, it was the revival of Breton music by the famous Alan Stivell, who started the revival of Breton music and Celtic music and Irish music. And I fell in love with Irish music. And uh, first, the concert flute, I started playing the whistle and the concert flute. And then I remember I was in a festival in Brittany, and there was a, a group there called Planksty. And I heard, when I heard the piper, Lee Morgan Flynn, who died recently, unfortunately, yeah. I said, I must go to Ireland and learn and play with this man. <laughs> it's the same as I did with Bob Brown. So in 1976, I went to Dublin, and then I went to, um, uh, it was a week of traditional music in Bunkrana, which is uh, not in County Donegal, not far from um, Derry. In fact, you had to, to cross Derry and go to, to it was in Don, Donegal, but not very far from Northern Ireland, you see. Okay. Uh -huh. and, and there was a week of Irish music workshops, different workshops, and the, the teacher for Irish piping was Lim Og O'Flynn. So I got some lessons from him for a week. I had a pract only a practice set of pipes, just the bag chanter and bellows. And later I, I bought the rest of the instrument, the drones and the regulators. But uh, I, I practiced with this man. And then when well, I did a lot of sessions in Dublin, I played in famous musicians, uh, uh, people like Paddy Keenan and uh, the, the Bathy Band, all the big groups of the time. I was quite friendly with, uh, with them because they, they used to come to Brittany for, in festivals, different festivals. And of course, we would meet here and there. And I kept all the contacts, you know. So that was my second love, which, which was Irish music. And my third love was Breton music because I discovered Breton music Later, <laughs> and I, I decided to move from St. Malo to the west part of Brittany, and I, I'm still in the west part of Brittany, between Roscoff and Lorient, where people still speak the Breton language. And I knew that, that was there that I, I had to go if I wanted to play uh, the, the music correctly, to play the Bigno, the Bombard, and learn the Breton language. So I left... Yes, do you, stay, do you stay at Carré? Yes, that's it. I, I live near 10 kilometers uh, next to Carré. Uh -huh. uh, so it's only, I'm one hour north of Lorient and one hour uh, west of, uh, east of Camper. Uh, so you're more or less in the middle of Yes, uh, right in the middle. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yesterday I, I was adjudicating at Camper for the uh, competition of solo piping and, uh, and I was among the competitors were Hervé Le Floc ah, good. and Sylvain Hamon uh -huh. uh, so I, I was adjudicating them and um, Sylvain Hamon won first prize by the way and Hervé was second <laughs> Sylvain is a, a wonderful player oh. I heard it also, of course. Oh, yes. No, all... and, uh, I always loved the, the bagpipe played by Sylvain. Uh, mm. Absolutely wonderful instrument. A wonderful a blower of an instrument, too. You know, oh, they, the, oh, yeah. Great everything they plays is sheer music. Yeah. Uh, so the, 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 I, I was surprised to hear a lot of very, very young players, under 20, very promising players. Uh -huh. uh, great fingers and great pipes. It's incredible how the, the, the uh, level of playing has increased in Brittany. So, some beautiful players at the moment, technically speaking. Very well taught. Yeah, well taught. Well yes. taught. Yes. Yes. And uh, so 
I had that uh, knowledge of Irish music, which enabled me to uh, uh, have a very good res results at the McCallum Trophy. Yes, uh, and that's, uh, that's, exactly. Uh, that's a lovely lead down. Uh, tell us now about uh, the McCallum Trophy. It started uh, 80, 81, round about that uh, time. Uh, you, uh, you just tell, it, tell the audience about it. Yes, exactly, exactly 1980 was the, the first edition, 1980. And it was an idea of Jean-Pierre Pichard and uh, Dougie Alexander. Uh, they had that idea to uh, create a new competition, a new concept uh, to have the Bretons, the Irish and the Scots competing on the three types of music. So it was easier for the Bretons because we already played uh, Scottish music, Breton music, of course. And we were quite interested by Irish music because we had a lot of musicians, as I told you a few minutes ago, coming to Britain in all the different festivals. But it was more difficult from Scots, uh, especially the, the Breton music, which they had no knowledge right. about, you know. No. And I, I had this advantage that I played Scottish music already. I was playing the Elwyn types and the flute, so I, I knew quite well, the Irish music, and I played the bombard and the binu, and I had the knowledge of the Breton music. So, uh, well, I I got, I won the first three editions in 1980, 1981, 1982. Excellent. And, and I was second in 1983. <laughs> <laughs> and after I stopped competing, like I, I was taken in different. Uh, with different groups, you know, uh, I, uh -huh. I, be I became a professional musician, so I was playing in different festivals, and I stopped competing even in Scotland. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, my last attempt for the gold, gold medal of Pibroch was in 1971. I first competed in 1970, and I had no prize, and in 1971. Bob Brown was in the uh, judging. He was among the judges with uh, uh, Nicol McCallum and Dr. Mackay. Uh -huh. And I remember I played the King's Taxes. And I forgot the last criminal before the, 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 the Orla. And Bob Brown came to me and he said, oh boy, for a while I thought you were going to get the medal. But you forgot that damn Krunua. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all my life, all my life, you know, I think. I, it maybe to the made history. I, I remember my pipes were just superb and I didn't miss anything. I was right in the tune. I, I had the tune from Bob Brown a few weeks before, you see. And, but I forgot the last Krunua. So I was not in the prize list. And, uh, I think I competed again the, the year after, but I didn't get any prize. And I completely stopped competing in, uh, for the gold medal. And um, it's one of my big uh, regrets in life. <laughs> yeah. It, tell me about your bagpipe. Uh, what uh, pipes it, you played then, and are you still playing the same instrument, or do you, do you have another well, uh, <laughs> At the time, I had a set of pipes which I had bought from uh, Bert, Bert Baron from St. Andrews. Bert Baron was the first teacher of, uh, of uh, Jack Taylor. Uh, and he used to go around the country looking for old pipes. And I remember one year he said, you're looking for a set of pipes, boy. Well, I have these pipes, very nice pipes. There are a set, set of gems center. He said, ah, uh -huh. so uh, I bought the pipes and I, for a long time, I thought they were center, but eventually I discovered they were not center. They were David Glenn, uh -huh. uh, a, a set of David Glenn. And I played with this pipe for a long time, but um, I don't have them anymore because I, I bought a, a very beautiful set of pipes from my friend Andrew Freta, he, uh, a set of Gavin McDougall pipes, which I yes. still have. 
And I was very friendly with the, one of my best friends who unfortunately died last November. His name was Pierre Blanchet from Brittany. And this man was a genius in the, uh, the repro reproduction of replicas of uh, old vintage bagpipes. Yes. And we went together, Pierre and I, we went to the museum, the National Museum in 2008, and we were given the permission to make uh, the copy of the Donald McDonald set made in 1806, which is in the National Museum at the moment, thanks to the help of Dr. Hugh Cheap and uh, uh, Andrew Fletcher, we were allowed to go to the museum and we had the instrument, we took all the measurements possible and Pierre made that beautiful uh, replica, which I have. And uh, I, this is my, my favorite instrument at the moment. Uh, incredible uh, drones. Uh, and uh, I, I did a few videos you know, of, uh, with this instrument on uh, uh, Jack Taylor and I, we started uh, a YouTube channel called uh, The Piper's Meeting. And you can still go there, The Piper's Meeting, and you will see myself and Jack Taylor. And we played extracts of the book. Uh, we, we published a book that was two years, two or three years ago. I managed to decipher all the unpublished pieces from the Colin Campbell uh, manuscript in Canterach. It was uh, 45 pieces which, which have never been put on paper. And with my friend Jack Taylor, uh, I, I managed to find the melodies, the tune and the rhythms and Jack uh, using a, how do you call it? A, a special, uh, to write the music, a computer uh, program. Yes, a, a computer program for a music, a bagpipe music. Yeah, writer. that's music. I'm not an expert on that. So we, we we managed to, maybe I, I can show you the book. Let's see. Mm. New, new tune yes. from the Campbell Cantarach by yes. Jack Taylor and Patrick Moulin. And so you have 45 tunes, which so far had never, never been put into staff notation. And uh, that was... Uh, uh, so we, we, we have... So where, where can people uh, find that uh, book? Where if people well, wish... I, I think now it's, it's uh, out of print, but uh, I, I have just heard that the people of society are willing to, to reprint some of the books. So soon it will be available on the people of society website. Yes, yes. Um, and... So the, the channel, the YouTube channel is called Piper's Meeting. And on, the, on this uh, channel, we've made videos where we played all these different tunes. And on some videos, I used the Donald McDonald replica, which I was uh, telling you about. And um, so I've got three sets of pipes at the moment. It's not easy. Right. See, excuse me, uh, I'm interested in your Don McDonald set of pipes uh, are they quite low pitched? Uh, what what chanter would you use with these pipes? Well, I have here the replica of the chanter. Ah, right. Uh, it is very very low pitched. Uh, it is. Uh, you, you know that. Uh, in Scotland, well, you, you call the, the first note A, but you know that it's not yes. A, it's B flat. But this this chanter is between A and B flat. Okay. Uh, very, very low pitched, very low for modern ears. And uh, the scale is a bit strange too. I mean, the, the, the B is a bit flat, the C uh -huh. is flat, the D is very high. <laughs> okay. E, e, okay, F, okay, the high G is beautiful. And high A is normal, but the bottom hand is very special, and uh, I don't yeah. think modern ears would like it very much. <laughs> I think we lost uh, that ear for that uh, pitch. 
a way back in probably the 50s and the early 60s, uh, because things started to climb from mid-60s onwards. Even mm -hmm. the, the Hardy chanter was, a, you know, a step up from that pitch. And mm -hmm. Harvey, a, the Hardy chanter a, a lost its appeal in the 70s. It's, yes. People yeah. stopped playing the Hardy chanter, and there was a perfectly good chanter. You know, uh, I still I still play my Hardy chanter. <coughs> I have a Hardy yeah. chanter made in 1983 by Bob Hardy with a silver sword, and I still play it on my pipes because I I don't like the high pitch myself, and I much prefer when I'm on, on yeah. my own. I and these Hardy chanters were beautiful. Uh, do, do you what do you play? What pipes do you play with the Hardy chanter then? Uh, uh, I play, I use the Hardy Changer on the Donald McDonald drones at the moment, and it goes <laughs> very well together. Yes. Yeah, it's but a, it's a, a long bladed uh, reed, isn't it, that fits into the Hardy Chanter, rather than the short blade that they do now. Uh, the Hardy Chanter, about another, uh, uh, for the, sorry, the reed to suit the Hardy Chanter was quite long in the blade. Well, uh, I use the reeds that make made by my friend Andrew, Andrew Freiter, and it's normal yeah. reeds. They're not too long, no, and it works quite well. And I don't have a single piece of tape on my chanter. No, no uh, I don't like myself either. I, and I don't the, like this business of gouging out notes and the chanter and all this sort of stuff. No, you know? no. <laughs> 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 I was a teacher, a music teacher, in my uh, town in Carré, in my the, the municipal school of music. So I used to teach Scottish pipes, Irish pipes, uh, Breton vinyl, and I also had uh, pupils on the whistle and the flute. And I did that for most of uh, my career, but I also played in plenty of different groups. Uh, and I played with very famous musicians like Alan Steven Group and Dan Amar's group. And I was almost professional for a while. And I stopped teaching for six years. And I was touring all over Europe. And I went to, to America to... Uh, so what was your favorite spot in the concerts and all that? What, what did you enjoy when you were traveling? Oh, Where did you enjoy going to? Well, of course, uh, I always loved going to Scotland and Ireland, you know, but um, I, I really enjoyed touring Spain, in particular northern Spain, Galicia and Asturias, and I did uh, uh, plenty of workshops teaching music to the Spanish players. They wanted me to teach them the Grace notes, the Scottish grace notes, the doublings yeah. and everything. Decoration, yeah. <laughs> yes. And so, uh, yes, the, the northern Spain, I really enjoy myself there. Northern Italy as well. Uh, the, um, I've been to Germany. Uh, I've been to Denmark. I've e even I went to Algeria and Yemen. Ah, uh -huh. In 1994, with my brother Jacques on the violin and a guitar player, we were invited by the French Institute in Sana, and I discovered a completely different country, of course. Uh, and I, I understand that at the moment uh, it's very dangerous because of the war, war yeah. between uh, Arabia and uh, Yemen, you know. Yeah. But, um, but I've never been to. Uh, to Eastern countries like Russia or Bulgaria. I've been to Poland twice uh, and I've been to America. Uh, 10 years ago, I was invited uh, to judge the Nickel Brown contest in, uh, in America. I was uh, invited by Paula Glendinning and Donald Lindsay. Yes. Who, uh, they were both pupils of Bob Brown. So. Uh, they wanted me to, as an ex pupil of Bob Brown, they wanted me to be among the judges. So I went there and I judged the competition. And nice, uh, very, some very nice competi competitors over there and uh, beautiful people. Yes. Hey, were you ever in Canada? 
uh, Patrick? Yes, I played in Montreal. Uh, I, well, I competed, as I told you, with the Henri Ray Paiban. I competed in Toronto in 1973. And then in the 90s, I played in the uh, Montreal Festival, Quebec Festival. Yeah. Um, I've been to New York, I've been to New, New Orleans, uh, but uh, I've, it was never for lo long stays, you know, so I no, no. just cannot say that I know America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, Whereabouts did you go in Germany? Oh, I, almost everywhere. I remember I used to play with a Breton group called Guerns, and we toured in Germany for three weeks in in the 80s, almost everywhere, north, yes. south, middle, east, uh, even, no, we didn't go to Eastern Germany. It was at the time when there was, it, they were reunited. You know? That's right, yeah. Uh, that didn't happen until uh, 1990, just yes. thereafter. Yes, uh, 1989, uh, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. So, um, I, I went to, I don't think I ever went to Berlin, but I was no. in Düsseldorf, Hamburg, right. um, Munich. Uh, Munich's a beautiful place. I've yes. been three or four times, and I like Bavaria as well. That's a, an interesting uh, time that you've had in piping, uh, Patrick, and uh, what, what occupies you in your piping uh, this year, for instance? Uh, we lost one of. Uh, I told you that we went to Yemen with a guitar player, Jacques Pelin. And unfortunately, Jacques, he died two years ago from COVID. He was one of the first victims in Brittany. And he was uh -huh. a great, great guitar player, great composer. And unfortunately, we couldn't uh, uh, pay a tribute to him because of the situation, because of the, the uh, sanitary uh, situation, it was impossible to organize anything. So we have decided to make a new group with musicians who had already worked with the Jacques Pelin. We have five. Uh, I play the pipes and the binu. My brother plays the guitar. He has a flute player, um, uh, a double bass player, and uh, Oh, I said, my brother plays the fiddle, sorry, and there's a guitar player. And we have, a, a, our first gig will be next August in the Lorient Festival. We've been invited by the new director, and we will play tunes that I used to play in different groups in the 80s and the 90s, both Scottish, Irish, Breton, of course, and some new compositions, but uh, we are not young musicians. You know, I, I must be the oldest. I'm. I'll be seventy-one next November, <laughs> and my brother is sixty-one. And I think the youngest is the guitar player. is only fifty. <laughs> so it's <laughs> not a... great, great stuff. Yes, uh, look forward to that. And uh, you would like to play. A line of a favorite and a practice chanter for me just to see us out at the end of the program, would you? How oh, about uh, Talakar then? How about Talakar, the Ardu Browns Talakar? Yeah, uh, so
Well done. Well done. Thank you very much, Patrick. That's a wonderful rendition. And this is a, a recall, Are You Brown, recording it. And uh, I think it's on the Peebles Society collection, if I remember. Uh, uh, no, the, the, the website, Peebles Society website. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick, for your company today. I'm quite sure the audience all over the world thoroughly enjoyed the conversation we had. And it's another new slant in piping and uh, um, somebody uh, from another part of the world on a commentary on Nickel and uh, Brown in particular. Okay, thanks very much, Alan. And I hope to see you in the near future again. It's yes, so so. Or in Scotland. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much, Patrick. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.